speaking of all these things that that we're you know looking to optimize, we cannot forget about one of the biggest elephants in the room. No pun intended. Obesity is really like this thing that that you know when you look at diabetes, uh, blood sugar, insulin resistance. Not to fat shame, not to put anything, but how big of an issue is the the carrying of visceral fat, the lack of exercise and heavy weight. How, how big of an issue is that and how correlated is that to diabetes and insulin resistance? It's almost like the chicken or the egg. And I think we still don't even mm. know, you know, what's coming first and what's not, because, you know, you start putting on or you start consuming a lot of refined sugars that directly causes visceral fat gain. So it's like the, the, the cortisol and the increase in the insulin is causing the visceral fat gain, but then the visceral fat gain is leading to worse insulin resistance as well. So it's like a vicious cycle. Um, You'll be hard pressed to find an obese person who isn't insulin resistant. So I think, you know, a lot of times what's driving that is both insulin and leptin resistance, you know, in regards to obesity. You know, it leads me into something you, you wrote about metabolic flexibility. What does that mean and how can we promote it? Because I think it falls in line with this idea of, of you know, being uh, uh, in the proper healthy weight class. How I view metabolic flexibility is being able to handle car- like a reasonable amount of carbohydrates. That's kind mm-hmm. of how I view it. Like if you're consistently in ketosis, you're not metabolically flexible. When you consume carbs, you're going to have a very insulin resistant, you know, glucose curve, um, which is why when you are in ketosis for a long period of time, you're on a low carb diet before you get an oral glucose tolerance test, you're supposed to consume like 150 grams of carbs for two weeks. Otherwise your glucose curve is going to look diabetic or pre-diabetic because you're, you're just not used to utilizing glucose as fuel. So you want to be in a state where you are able to handle a fairly decent amount of carbohydrates. And really that comes down to being, you know, active, um, exercise, having a good amount of muscle mass, getting your micronutrients in, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's talk about that diet. You call it the blood sugar fix diet within the book, but what does that look like as far as proteins, fats, carbs? You're you're saying carbs are not the enemy. Even sugar is not truly the enemy as long as it's in the proper ratios and everything and qualities. So what is the blood sugar fix diet? So it's kind of like a like a scale grading depending on what your baseline carbohydrate tolerance is. So if you're mm-hmm. if you're type 2 diabetic, then a lower amount of carbohydrates is important to allow you to get used to and your body used to handling the carbs. As you become pre-diabetic, so let's say less than 60 grams of carbs or so for someone who's type 2 diabetic is probably a good idea. When you go pre-diabetic, less than 100 grams of carbs, and then when you are normal healthy, somewhere in the range of 100 to 200 grams, higher end if you're on a more active day. It's typically the carb range. Yeah, and and going beyond diet, which is incredibly important, let's look at some of the systems and organs of the body because I found this kind of fascinating as well as the brain's role in all of this and why, why it is so important within the idea of insulin resistance, how much it uses of insulin it produces. So can you talk about that, the brain's role in blood sugar optimization? Yeah, it's it, what's interesting is everything comes from the mouth. Everything is affected then from the gut and the gut affects the brain. And so what mm-hmm. ends up happening is if you eat any type of inflammatory diet, you do increase intestinal permeability and you then have basically endotoxin or what's called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, that is now getting into the bloodstream. And which is not supposed to happen. That will activate basically the immune system in the brain to release things like tumor necrosis factor alpha and cause inflammation in the brain. And that can lead to basically central insulin, leptin resistance, but also peripheral um, resistance as well. So it's kind of crazy to think that what you eat affects your gut, which then affects the brain. And then that affects the entire body. Yeah, I mean, it's all interconnected. And even if we move down for the brain just a little bit to the thyroid, you know, talk about how that is so important when we're looking and talking about blood sugar. Yeah, well, it's kind of like the, you know, the system that sets your metabolism, like how fast your metabolism is. Are you able to burn 
you know, the same amount of calories as someone else. Like if someone has low thyroid, they will literally become fatter consuming the same amount of calories as someone who doesn't. So it's not just about calories. It also comes down to hormones like the thyroid hormones. Um, and the two minerals that are extremely important for thyroid health is iodine and sodium. Sodium allows iodine to get into the thyroid gland. Um, and, and magnesium is important for ATP and the pump to do that. So even your micronutrient status will determine your thyroid status, which determines your metabolism, which determines, you know, how well you can handle calories and how how much your blood sugar might go up from a meal. And what are those foods and things we could take to optimize our thyroid function? So seafood, shellfish um, are, are good sources of iodine, but also sodium, which is both important for thyroid health. Um, liver is very important as well for overall micronutrient status. Eggs, like I don't, there's not a single day that goes by where we're not having probably like three pastured eggs um, in the morning. So I practice what's basically like more animal-based diet. Most of my calories are coming from, you know, basically eggs, lean meats, um, yogurt, grass-fed yogurt, things like that. And then, you know, is the side dish, so to speak, is the vegetables. Now, they're great because they're, you know, you can have a half a plate of vegetables and it's barely any calories. It's super filling. And then the protein and the fats are what give you the long-term satiety. So combining both is really a great way to curb hunger. But if you don't tolerate vegetables, that's okay. Um, it's not like it's super necessary because the nutrients in vegetables are very low bioavailability. Mm -hmm. and, and if we move on to something like autoimmune conditions would continue to be on the rise. What's that connection there to diabetes and blood sugar? Comes back to the immune system. You have these, you know, basically, you know, T helper cells. You have these other controller cells. And when you start sort of overstimulating the immune system, that's when autoimmunity can start kicking in. That's why you can start seeing diabetes. It's like a type two form, but it's not, it's, it's like a type one form, but it's happening later on, like a latent, like adult onset diabetes. And so it, it all comes down to the, the inflammatory response from the food damaging your immune system. And now you basically have too much of, you know, one part of the immune system activated, not enough of the controller immune system kind of suppressing, you know, the over inflammation. And that's really what triggers autoimmunity. 